Hello, everybody. I wasn't going to get through this completely straight, I'll be honest. Oh, also, as I keep doing these videos, you might start to notice that, like, there's less stuff behind me. I think, like, every video something disappears. It's because I'm moving. It's not, and I'm packing things up ahead of time. It's not, like, nobody's robbing me. It's not weird. It's nothing weird. What is weird is that I appear to be dressed like Steven Seagal today, so you're welcome for that, Steve fans. My Kindle was giving me a problem. It was like, please don't open the missus. I'm begging you to keep reading The Ashes and the Star-Cursed King. And I'm like, I have to read the missus. I'm so sorry. And it's like, please, no. But we got to do this. We got to read the missus. Where we last left off in chapter six was that Caroline was like, oopsie, I told your fiance that we used to bone. And oopsie, I also told your mother that you're getting married and she's going to be here any minute. Surprise! Because like the wedding has just started. Oh, I need my glasses. And of course, okay, so the last, I want to point out that chapter six ended with him saying, fuck, right? But the first sentence of chapter seven is, darling, I'm already here. Well then, Why wasn't that the chapter hook? I messed up though because it says a clipped mid-Atlantic voice drawls over the light breeze towards us. I don't remember his mom being American, but now I have to try to figure out a mid-Atlantic? Come on. I guess that's like, um, like half British would be? All I can think about is like Catherine Hepburn, but she had a very distinctive, what do I do? How do I come up with a mid-Atlantic? I'm gonna end up talking like, um, like the Beals from Grey Garden, but that wasn't, that wasn't mid-Atlantic, was it? Hang on, we need to look this up. Oh, it is an upper-class New York accent. That is how she talked. Not like that, not that bad, but you know. They didn't know what a staunch character they were dealing with. Okay, so we gotta figure this out. We gotta figure out what a mid-Atlantic accent is. Mid-Atlantic accent. Like, I just need a list of people that had it. Okay, Auntie Mame, David Hyde Pierce, Kelsey Grammer, David Ogden Starr. I know that. All right, um, Darth Vader has a mid-Atlantic. I didn't know that. Darth Vader, you're so fancy. I have no idea how much of this is making it into the video, but I'm having a very good time. Oh, so it basically sounds like it's just a made-up accent. Sideshow Bob, huh? I don't know if I can do the transatlantic. Maybe his mom will just have to be little Edie. Darling, she doesn't seem like a staunch character. That was too New York for little Edie. I understand this. You know, let's not criticize. These are, this is free. This is free, okay, everybody? This is free on YouTube, so you, you're gonna get what you pay for. Darling, I'm here already. A clipped mid, oh wait, this is in his point of view. A clipped mid-Atlantic voice drolls over the light breeze toward us. We whirl around as my heart sinks and my mother is making her way down the drive through the crowd. She's dressed in a heavy black coat, probably from Chanel's upcoming collection for next winter, with oversized Chanel sunglasses, a faux fur hat, and Louboutin boots. Okay, so we have this image that now is immediately Elaine Stritch in um, uh, 30 Rock. All she needs to do is be in a wheelchair. We whirl around. <laughs> Makes me think that they're just spinning in circles. Someone pointed that out to me once in a critique group because I said someone whirled around. And they said, you just need to say world because world is like turning quickly, but world around is, is like spinning in circles. <laughs> I just love the thought of Maxim being like, fuck, it's my mother. Whee! <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, and then anyway, the idea that she's like decked out head to toe in Chanel is like hilarious. Well, except for the Louboutin boots. But it's just hilarious to me because I'm like, sure, why not? Why wouldn't E.L. James be here to throw some Nazi sympathizer bullshit in here? I've probably talked about Chanel before. You know what? I don't think maybe you guys, if any of you are like real into my books and have read them a million times, um, do I ever mention Sophie or anybody wearing Chanel? 
The reason that I ask is because I don't particularly like Chanel, and so I can't imagine that I would have mentioned, but um, it's always really important for me to point out that she was a fucking Nazi. Ugh! Accompanying her is a young man about my age, dressed in black Montclair. He has model good looks, American teeth, and I suspect he's her latest fuck. First of all, good for her. Second of all, let's not talk about American teeth. Because, like, look at this. Like, it looks like corn. I look like I got a, a mouthful of niblets. Our teeth are not as good as everybody seems to think they are. Like, I have a cavity back here. Ugh. Ugh. My cavity. I should... I should zoom in on this cavity. By the time I'm done, like, with these recaps, I will have done so many different accents, I think, that, like, I won't have my Michigan accent anymore, and I'll just sound weird. Like, just full-on weird. Like, a lot of times, if I'm doing a video, I try not to sound too Michigan. Like, like, a lot of times, I'm like, okay, Jenny, it's time to put on your voice where you just talk, and you, you don't sound like a total backwoods Michigan rube. But, like, I... That probably won't even be a thing anymore by the time I'm done trying to keep up with all these accents. But I want you to note, I have not tried to do an Albanian accent because I am not going to get cancelled. I assume it sounds like Italian, which I also get out to do. So probably not Albanian. I'm assuming Italian. Isn't Albania near Italia or, or Italy or... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know maps. All right. I can give credit where credit is due, and I think this little interplay here is actually clever. Joe and Tom you know, and Judas Iscariot, my sister-in-law. I take a small amount of pleasure in Carolyn's ashen face as she gives her mother-in-law a quick kiss. So like he, I, I don't know, something about that, I'm like, okay. As much as I hate to say that something was kind of cute or anything in here, fuck it. Fuck a duck. Good news! The young guy that his mom is banging is blonde. You know, he ain't gonna be up to no good. His name is Heath. Okay, so like anything good, she ruins it. Because on the very next page, she's like, his mom's like, oh, hey, can we have a word? And he's like, not right now. I'm afraid it's not convenient at this time. I'm about to get married. Please make your way into the venue. I wave her in the direction of the Marquis. Judas will find a seat for you. You know, repeating something doesn't actually make it funnier. I mean, sometimes it does. Like, I like it if somebody has, like, okay, super easy, barely an inconvenience, still puts me on the floor, like, nonstop, right? That guy, super easy, barely an inconvenience. That's hilarious. The repetition is hilarious, but he doesn't do it like nine times in one video. Okay, this wasn't nine times. This was twice, but still, it was funny the first time. It's less clever and funny the second time. Feels like he's congratulating himself. Oh, we also, in Maxim's point of view here, that Carolyn is wearing Manolo Blahniks, and I want to say real quick here that, yes, I had a male, you know, hero, a male love interest, in my boss series who could readily identify shoes but it was because he had a foot fetish i'm not here to prevent your wedding maxim that would be a little vulgar don't you think but we will talk afterwards and you will explain to me why you are marrying the help and why the fuck you haven't invited your grieving mother to this event are you ashamed of your bride and her family because frankly that's how this looks yes Yes, ma'am. That is exactly what is. He is ashamed. He is ashamed to the point that he did not want to tell any of you that he was getting married. He absolutely wants to redo the whole thing when they get back to the UK so that it's official. He is ashamed of his bride's ethnicity. Like, I cannot even. Like, I can't. The Oh, Lord. Good Lord. I didn't invite you, Rowena, dearest. I leaned down and whispered in her ear. Because you're doing exactly what I thought you'd do. Projecting your pretentious, privileged shit onto my situation. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm about to marry the woman I love. Oh, her pretentious, privileged shit. 
her pretentious privilege. Not your, yours has not come into play at all in any of this. None of this. You have not been pretentious or privileged in any of this. It's your mom that is now the pretentious privileged one. Okay. Oh, surprise, surprise. People actually look like, you know, people in Albania. And it's like so shocking that a woman would take pride in her appearance in Albania, don't you know? So let's go ahead and take a look at Maxim, who is not privileged or pretentious, what he thinks about his mother-in-law when he sees her. Behind him, Jack and Spressa have appeared at the front door. I turn to greet them. Spressa is almost unrecognizable. She's wearing a pale pink shift dress and a matching chiffon wrap. Her hair is quaffed and sleek and dark like Alexia. Alessia's, not Alexia. Alessia's. And she's wearing a little makeup. She looks stunning. It's tiring. It's out. It's tiring to read like these. To, to, I don't know to read that he's like, oh, so and so is privileged and pretentious. My mom is privileged and pretentious, and she's bringing her privileged and pretentious bullshit to my wedding. Oh no. Oh no. Right. And then he turns around and is like, oh. This peasant is dressing like a, a, the way a person would dress to go to their child's wedding. Wow. I turn and make the introductions. Jack, Spressa, my mother has decided to grace us with her presence. May I present Rowena, Dowager Countess of Trevithick. I stress the word Dowager and Rowena's lips tighten, because it's rude and also incorrect. But she doesn't miss a beat, and graciously she holds out her hand. Okay, let's take it back here again. Pretentious privileged. And then he's like, I know what will make my mom mad. I will not use the correct title for her because I am not privileged and pretentious, but somehow still know what the correct title is and how to use someone's title or misuse it to insult them. Holy crap. Love that he says she graced them with her presence. She did not know about this. <clears throat> You can't get mad if they don't come. Well, here's a really good thing about the Demachis that I was not aware of previously. Maybe it was in the book and I don't remember it, but it says that they have a no shoes in the house policy that they're breaking just for today. So, uh, you know, I already like them. I don't like shoes in the house. I hate shoes in the house. I loathe shoes in the house. Finally, I think they're getting married, you guys. I think it's happening because he walks into the house and everybody's in the house. I think it's happening. I think they're getting married because he sees her in the wedding dress waiting in the front room. She's a vision in lace, satin, and a soft diaphanous material silhouetted by the light from the window. I stop and stare at the woman who will shortly become my wife and completely lose my train of thought. She's gorgeous, with dark, expressive eyes ringed in coal. She looks a little more sophisticated, a little more knowing, but demure and sexy as hell. She takes my breath away. Her gown is the epitome of elegance, a tight white satin corset covered in lace, lace over her shoulders and arms, and from her waist a skirt that flares softly. There are tiny pearl buttons at the front, her hair is curled in a delicate updo beneath a fine gossamer veil. He's really into women's clothing. She looks every inch a goddess. No, a countess. My countess. Dude, don't get emotional. I... She looks like a goddess. No, a countess. You know, I'm not privileged and pretentious, but I really do think that nobility is higher than divinity. I... That... Dude! He says, dude, so that means he's not privileged and pretentious. Um, I think I need to be cast in the movie version as Maxim because I am nailing it. 
Suddenly I no longer care that what we're doing may not be strictly legitimate. I'm just so glad and thankful that we're doing this today, here, now. Okay, we're still going with the it's not legitimate because we're in Albania thing. After you went to the government office, you filled out the paperwork. We were forced to go with him to the government office to fill out paperwork. And he's still like, mm, they don't speak English. A little bit sketchy. But he's not pretentious and privileged. At all. I step forward and kiss her cheek. You look stunning. And I realize this is the first time I've seen her in makeup. Oh, good lord. Good lord. It's fine if you don't want to wear makeup. Clearly, I, I, I do not pile it on. I, I am fine wearing makeup. I am fine not wearing makeup. Either way, I, I think it's a bullshit hassle for me personally, but I know lots of people that wouldn't be caught dead without it. I don't have a moral or political stance on makeup. But the idea that this heroine has never worn makeup, fine, she doesn't. But the idea that it's like, it, it's being presented as like, she's so beautiful and she's so stunning and she's wearing makeup, but she was so stunning without the makeup. Like it's, uh, it's just all of that. You don't know you're beautiful. That's what makes you beautiful kind of bullshit that I cannot handle in books anymore. I just can't. He introduces Rowena to Alessia and Rowena is surprised that Alessia speaks English. This is how it goes down. You speak English. Rowena sounds surprised. Fluently, Alessia replies, and I could fucking kiss her. My girl has teeth. How is that having teeth? She's like, oh, you speak English? Fluently. But I guess it's like some big dig because she's proving that she's not lesser. Like all the other Albanians in the story are lesser but she is a little bit better because she speaks English. And so what she has done is proved to her mother-in-law that she is better than the rest of the Albanians. The fact that there is an Albanian version of these books blows my mind. Who in Albania is sitting here enjoying this stuff? I, it, it, it is, it, it eludes me. Um, He's like, let's go get married. Oh, wait, I forgot. There's tradition. I'm supposed to give you this. And it's like a handkerchief with like a sugared almond in it. And he puts the sugared almond into her mouth. And that's like, you know, just, just so that we're aware, we have to know all of this, the research. And it's a real fucking good sugared almond, okay? Maxim is mesmerizing, especially in his sharp, dark suit. She's never seen him dressed this elegantly before, and he looks born to it. But of course he is. He's an aristocrat. I'm just a sad little old Albanian peasant cleaning lady. Oh, oh, I'm just a little satellite flying too close to the sun. His eyes shine a brilliant green as his gaze moves from her eyes to her mouth. His lips are slightly parted as Alessia licks, then presses her lips against the candy he's holding. Mmm, she murmurs, and he shuts his eyes for a nanosecond, then pops the sweet into his mouth. The muscles deep in Alessia's belly tighten, and she inhales sharply. He gives her a wicked grin full of sensual promise. It gives her an idea, dot, 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 for later when they're finally alone together. So, like, like I said, that's, that's one, one hell of an almond. Um, but just, just in case anybody ever, you know, has sex with me, um, pro tip, don't, almonds don't need to be a part of it. It sounds like we're going to have a scene where, like, she puts an almond on her mouth and then he eats the almond, or, like, maybe she's going to chew up the almond and spit it into his mouth like a baby bird, like with the wine and Christian and, uh, and Anna, I almost called her Anna, Christian and Anna in Fifty Shades of Grey, something like that's going to happen. I know it's just going to sick me the fuck out. He loves her. He told her in no uncertain terms this morning, and his declaration has fortified her inner strength. Since Caroline's shocking revelation, Alessia has realized that his family is challenging her. She squares her shoulders. Challenge accepted. Maxim is worth fighting for. 
All right, so now we know that the rest of this book is going to be about whether or not she wants to fight to keep Maxim, because she's stated that that is her goal, and in an E.L. James novel, if someone states their goal, the rest of their storyline is wondering whether or not they actually want to achieve that goal. You can go back and reread her shit. I'll wait. You can pause it, but that's, that's what it is. We're not going to be in Alessia's POV for too much longer. Not that I've read ahead, just that, you know, we know this. We've seen this happen, right? We know that we're not going to be in her POV very much longer. It's really important for Erica to give us the rundown on, um, you know, how she's feeling just by just outright telling us, right? She knows that she must build a bridge with Caroline. After all, she's Maxim's sister-in-law. But still, she's wary. Caroline has her own agenda, and Alessia suspects she's in love with Maxim. No! I am stunned. I am shocked. I am appalled. I never would have guessed. This is an unexpected and shocking plot twist that we are going to definitely deal with in this book, and it will be in no way insufferable. Okay. They went inside the house. Now that they're in the house, they have to leave the house. Alessia has to pretend to cry about leaving her family's house because, like, it's part of the tradition. And now we are outside. This is really gonna happen. It's, it's happening. It's all happening. Okay, so this is really gonna happen. All right. Whew. They are in front of the registrar. The registrar reads through, it says that he reads through the code for the family. And it's basically like, this is what's expected of you to get married. Because remember, like, Albania is actually like a pretty much a secular country. So this is like a secular wedding, I guess. I was afraid that we would have to hear the entire, like, wedding ceremony. But in true E.L. James fashion, she decides to comment on it. She decides to make a big deal in the press and in her acknowledgments about all the research that she did about these traditions and then skips completely past the wedding and insults it. Um, the, the registrar, by the way, his name looks like it's Tabaku. If I'm not saying that correctly, I apologize. I don't speak Albanian. Tabaku goes on and on and on, and I think it takes longer because poor Thanos has to translate everything. Behind us, the crowd, even though they are seated, begins to fidget. There are coughs and snickers, and a baby starts to cry. A child says something that causes some tittering in the congregation, but I have no idea what he said. I think it's his mother that removes him from the room, and I suspect he needs the lavatory. You know what, dude? Just be glad you're not marrying an Orthodox chick. Because you want to talk about a wedding that takes a long time? Yeah, try doing everything you just did, but longer and three times just to make sure it sticks. But yeah, because it's too long and Maxim thinks it's too long, she skips over it and it's another one of those catch-22. Like, I am so glad that we didn't have to read all of her research and I have been dragging her every time she says anything about the research. Um, or anything, not about the research. Anytime she's said something that, you know, shows that it's like, oh, hey, I researched this. Like, the, the obvious touches of better include this because I did the research. So I've been making fun of all that. So it seems unfair to make fun of the scene for not showing all of that stuff. Yet at the same time, this isn't fair. This is Jenny Trout's YouTube. I'm the Goblin King, baby. You got that reference, right? You all got that reference? That Sarah keeps saying, that's not fair. And he says, you say that so often. I wonder what your basis for comparison is. That, you remember? Okay. Just, I'm just making sure we're both on the same page that we have some Labyrinth fans here. If you are a Labyrinth fan, please let me know in the comments, you know. Um, and uh, let's refrain from talking about the bulge because the poor man is deceased. They say that, yeah, like they, they say, you know, like that they consent to the marriage. He's like, you're now married. Congratulations. And you can exchange rings. So they exchange rings. And he kisses Alessia on the hand. And then we have to see this sentence with my two eyes. I had to see this sentence with my eyes. 
with these. And now I have to throw them away because I had to see this sentence. I have to get rid of what were perfectly good eyes because of this. Alessia's answering smile is crotch-tighteningly beautiful. It is your wedding day, sir. It is your wedding day. Why are you calling this woman crotch-tighteningly beautiful? Like, like, come on. Like, that's what I really hope that my husband thought um, when we got married and when he kissed me. I hope he looked down into my face, my, my beautiful 26-year-old face, and thought to himself, she is crotch-tighteningly beautiful. Not, you know, like, I love her so much, or I'm so lucky. Uh, no, I, I really hope that, that what, he, what he thought in his heart was that I was crotch-tighteningly beautiful. Yay, they're married! The guys are signing the marriage contract. They're the witnesses. Yay, they're married. Um, everybody comes over, starts to congratulate them. His mom comes over, congratulates them. We go into Alessia's POV for this. His mom comes over, starts to congratulate them, and then Verity, oh, I'm sorry, Marianne. Marianne throws her arms around Maxim, and he hugs her. Maxie, she says, and she reaches out a hand to Alessia at the same time. Congratulations, you two. I hope you'll be very happy. She releases Maxim and hugs Alessia. Reformed rakes make the best husbands, she whispers, but before she can respond, Alessia is distracted by Caroline, who's touching Maxim's lapel, a beseeching look in her big blue eyes. So, how do we know that this is Poldark fanfic? <laughs> That whole reformed rakes uh, make the best husbands is like a real saying that they used to say back in like pole dark times. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's funny. It's the funniest thing I've ever fucking heard. That is Verity telling Demelza that. Now I don't, as far as I recall, that phrase does not happen in either the TV show or in the novel of Poldark, but I will say with 100% certainty that um, this continues to be Poldark fanfic. Caroline um, congratulates them both. She says, Congratulations, Alessia, and I'm so sorry for what I said last night. It was graceless and utterly uncalled for. Alessia, acting on pure instinct, hugs her before she can say anything else. There's like a special table that they sit at. They go and sit there. Two kids come and give them um, plates from the buffet. It's later in the night. Um, Maxim rolls his eyes and turns to Alessia. You didn't mention dancing with a bunch of men. Man, what the fresh hell is this? Okay, okay, I'm coming. Joe, Tom, come join me. I call over to them at their adjacent table where they're sitting with my family. Murkash puts his hands on my shoulder, then takes my hand and several of his, no, our male relatives join us, linking hands, including Tom and Joe. He's <laughs> Oh, I wondered when there would be homophobia in this and the whole like, dude, man, bro, I can't dance with men is, is, and then there's dancing. There's like traditional Albanian wedding dancing. I stand and watch with Joe and Tom. It's affecting this expression of male kinship, one that we don't choose to encourage in the UK. Vaguely, I wonder why that's the case. Homophobia. And, you know, rugby, I guess. Like, you guys touch each other a lot playing rugby, right? Like, you just, like, rush right at each other. I don't know. I'm gonna be kind, because you know what, my UK friends? Um, I starched you up and down that last video. <laughs> So, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to go easy this time. I don't want people to think that I don't like people from the UK. I do. After a couple of hours of exhausting carousing and more dancing, we finally cut the impressive, highly decorated wedding cake and eat it with a glass of champagne. Could have used a fork! Are we all ready to hear some adult, like, 
male nobility, like, talking as if they were 12-year-old Americans. <laughs> Trevor Thick, as weddings go, this has been a good one. Different, Tom says. Yeah, it's cool, bro. Joe claps me on the back. You look happy. Don't let your mother kill your buzz. <laughs> it's cool, bro! <laughs> um, Alessia is going to change while they wait for the taxi to get there because Maxim is like, oh, the reception isn't over, but I'm ready to go. Like, that's literally, before that part that I read, he's like... Our guests will continue into the night, but I'm done. I want out. I want to be alone with my bride. Well, like, there's, like, not anything, like, like, he, he even says, just, he just tells her, our cab should be here shortly. Like, it's not like, hey, do you want to leave your own wedding? It's like, nope, I'm done, let's go. While they're waiting for the taxi to get there, Maxim looks around the room, he sees his mom, like, flirting with this guy. Then he looks at Marianne. Marianne's talking to one of the cousins. Caroline is staring at dot dot dot. Me! She gets up. Shit. I don't want or need any more drama from her. She sidles up to me and I know she's had too much to drink. Caro, sup? I ask, my heart sinking. <laughs> I had to try three times. Three times to read that because I could not contain myself at Caro. Sup. <laughs> if you want to write an American, just write an American. Just write an American. If you want to write about a 12-year-old American boy, write about a 12-year-old American boy, and he can say dude and sup and bro as much as he wants. I promise you. Stop being an ass, she snaps. What? You know what? I stare at her, trying to convey how monumentally she fucked up disclosing our personal shenanigans to Alessia. You know, if you shenan once, you're probably gonna shenan again. Which is my favorite saying of 2023, so whoever thought that up, good job. Alessia didn't need to hear that from her. She should have heard it from me. Well, she didn't, because you didn't talk to her about it. You're gonna wait until she had the ring on. I just wanted to say sorry. Again. Are you going to ignore me forever? I sigh. I'll see. You fucked up, Caro. You need to stop that. Are you going to keep ignoring me at your own wedding? You don't have anything else going on. Why are you ignoring me, Maxim? Oh my god. This reminds me of that girl on TikTok that she does all those things where she's like, Oliver, will you help me carry this? It's too heavy. I'm not like other girls. I'm too tiny. I'm too small. I wish I was fat like Emily. Like that chick, do you know what I'm talking about? So someone, one of you, one of you, one of you knows the chick that I'm talking about. Which I feel really bad because it, she nails that character so perfectly that she has to be like a normal human being, but I hate her because of the character. <laughs> I still follow her, though, and I still love her. So if any of you personally know her, tell her I love her. At least somebody is seeing the problems with the aristocracy that I am, because then his mom comes up to him and says, I'll be brief. I wish you every happiness. My mother's smile doesn't reach her eyes. On the plus side, this young girl will inject new DNA into our gene pool, but she has no idea what she signed up for. You can at least enroll her in some etiquette lessons so she doesn't make a complete fool of herself or you when you're in company, or perhaps send her to finishing school. She might have a hope then. I love it. I absolutely love that she's like, this young girl will inject new DNA into our gene pool. She's like, you know, we're all in, but why? Wait. Wouldn't she have injected? Is, is she from the United States? I don't remember. Because she has a transatlantic accent, so she would be from the United States, right? That's a U.S. thing. As far as I'm aware, that's something that only we have, right? Like, that fake accent is sort of like the received pronunciation in the U.K., that fake accent. And our received pronunciation fake accent is um, transatlantic, right? I could be wrong. I don't know. 
I'm still struggling though. I'm still struggling to figure out what's going on with his mom because the transatlantic accent makes me think that she's American and the thing with um like the new new blood into the gene pool or whatever that's throwing me because wouldn't she have been the new blood? I mean obviously they're aristocracy so they are just generation upon generation of people fucking their cousins but I don't know. I don't remember her being mentioned as being American. She offers to um, pay for Alessia to go to finishing school. Alessia is with her mom changing out of her bridal gown and um, she's like you could still come with us and her mom is like no but your father and I will come visit you and you know so once again just be aware um, the thing that can save an abusive marriage is your daughter marrying a count. That's all you need to fix an abusive relationship. Everything goes just fine. You know, like it's abusive and then your daughter gets human trafficked and then she meets a count and then she gets kidnapped and then she marries the count and then problem solved. Problem solved. With, with actually with no nothing on the paper, just it, you can just tell the audience that you can just you can just directly tell. You can have the character just say that everything in her abusive marriage is fine now. I feel like E.L. James has done this because she wanted to show Maxim getting along with Alessia's father, that she wanted to show um, this sort of happy ending in which Alessia really didn't have to do anything or change anything, but we can see that she cares about her mom, she's concerned about her mom, we can have the drama, but it's not really dramatic, and also so that we can see um, Maxim have these, like, father of the bride moments with his father-in-law, um, without readers going, wait a second, this guy beats the shit out of them. Alessia reappears in a makeshift wedding venue looking radiant. First of all, it's not a makeshift wedding venue. It is the wedding venue. It is the venue in which you got married. I'm sorry it wasn't good enough for you. I'm sorry it was in Albania. I'm sorry that you are the way you are, E.L. James. But nobody can fix any of that right now. She's changed into a simple emerald dress that clings dot 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 everywhere. Fuck. My body tightens everywhere. All right, well, if your body is tightening everywhere, you might have lockjaw. I assume that you got it from being in Albania because obviously where you're from is modern and clean and wonderful, and you are in this pigsty filth hole of a place that E.L. James didn't particularly enjoy her vacation to. Uh, but that's what I would say. It's possibly that's happening. Now, I'm not a doctor. I am an epileptic. Perhaps I would say you might be having a seizure, in which case, you know, I've had success with Lamictal, like a cocktail of, of drugs around Lamictal. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, but big props to E.L. James on Alessia wearing a dress that clings dot 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 everywhere, and then him his body tightening everywhere, italics. You look lovely, I whisper. I can't wait to get you out of this dress. It's then that I notice a slit up one side, and I catch a glimpse of her stockinged thigh and high-heeled shoes. Oh, man. Let's go. Now. So, it's a good thing there was a slit in that skirt so he could see the high-heeled shoes that are apparently on her thigh. The Mercedes C-Class is waiting, and our driver, one of Alessia's cousins, opens the passenger door. Alessia turns and gives the throng one last wave before climbing in. I dash around to the other side and clamber in beside her. You don't like the guns, he says. No, I don't. Welcome to Albania. He laughs and puts his foot down and speeds away from the revelry, the gunfire, and the best wedding a man could have hoped for, given the, given the circumstances and the fact that it was organized within a week. I'm sure your next one will be so much better. I love that you don't like the guns. <laughs> Welcome to Albania. Like, it's, she just can't go a fucking chapter. She can't go a two fucking pages without being like, ha ha, look at these backward ticks. Look at them. Oh my gosh, they're so primitive. Anyway, buy the Albanian version of my book. Like, there's no way this is a hit in Albania, right? Like, there's no way that people are just like buying this shit like popcorn, right? God, what I wouldn't give to see the Albanian sales figures. 
I really, I was really worried that I was gonna have to, um, because I've already been doing this for like 40 minutes, which granted a lot of it was taken up by the whole trying to figure out the transatlantic accent and like what it is and, and then trying to figure out what Edie Beale's, like little Edie's accent was, but we're not gonna have to sit through a sex scene in this chapter. Thank God. That's because they're not even to the hotel yet. So yeah, they drive away and Alessia is like looking out the window and like she's, you know, starting to tear up because she's so lucky that she's with Maxim, a guy who holds her family and her country and her um, ethnic identity in such low esteem that he's convinced that their wedding isn't even legitimate. Um, she's thinking about how lucky she is to have landed him. And then um, the chapter mercifully, mercifully ends because he said, he says, I've got you. You've got me. We've got this. It's going to be great, he says. And Alessia's tears of joy slide down her cheeks, letting some of her emotion out into the world. Some of it. I mean, like, not all of it, just, like, letting some of it out. Yeah, so that is a just an absolute fucking train wreck of a book, and it just continues. It's like the first train car smashed into the tunnel that, like, Wiley Coyote painted onto the side of the the bluff and and it smashed into it and then all the other cars are continuing to just ram into it and we are just like helpless we're just like fucking helpless to stop this from happening to us or anyone that's not true I can stop it from happening I can stop making these videos but I won't do you know why because I can't make my Bridgerton videos because of the strike I hope they get what they want I hope they all get what they want but let me tell you my Bridgerton recaps my Bridgerton videos on here the reacts that I've been doing I got up until like the massive cliffhanger when she's like he said he would marry me and then they went on strike and I can't watch any more or post any of those. Oh, well, I guess I could watch them and I could post. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to watch them and then post them later because I feel like that's dishonest. I feel like, I don't know. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But it would be weird if like the strike dragged out for like two years and like I lost an eye and like suddenly I'm doing all these videos with an eye patch and then like they're doing those videos like, you know, where I didn't have an eye patch and people are like, you're lying because you you said you had an eye patch. I I can't I, I can't guarantee that something isn't going to happen to my eyes. Like I could read one of those awful sentences like crotch tighteningly. Like I could read that somebody was crotch tighteningly beautiful and then have to just scoop them out with a melon baller. So I guess I won't do that. But the point is that we are all on this train that is hitting that wily e. coyote tunnel. We are all on it together. And that's why we are going to have to be of staunch character. Anyway, I'll catch you on the flip side. And uh, like, subscribe, comment. You know, show this video to your friends. Show, show, show it to people who hate E.L. James. Show it to people who love E.L. James. Make them come in the comments. Fight with me. That's fun, too. Um, I'm recapping Model Land uh, over on my Patreon. Model Land is so good. It is ridiculous how good that book is. So head on over to my Patreon to get my thoughts on Model Land. And um, yeah, I will uh, see you later.